Hello, and welcome back to the Common Connected Podcast. I'm your host, Janine Halloran, and on today's episode, I get a chance to speak with Dr. Varlisha Lyons. Dr. Varlisha is an occupational therapist who's been working in the field for over 20 years, but she wears a lot of different hats, which she'll share about in the beginning where she shares her biography a little bit, and she shares a little bit about all the different roles that she has. But the things that I just wanted to highlight is that she is a, has been a PESI presentation speaker and she continues to lecture internationally and she's authored four books, one of which is a bestseller. On today's podcast, we talk a little bit more about neuroscience and self-regulation and we get into some of her go-to strategies that she likes to use with kids. We also talk about the beauty of having a multidisciplinary team where you can work together supporting the kids in your lives and coming at the challenges that they bring from different perspectives, not only from the occupational therapy side, the therapy side, counseling, mental health, but also involving speech and language pathologists and other people who are part of the team. I think it's really important to be able to have as many people involved as possible to be able to do the best job that we can for the kids in our lives. And we also talk a little bit about the importance of evidence-based practice. So I hope that you enjoy our interview. Dr. Varlisha, welcome to the Common Connected podcast. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm so excited to have you on here. As we were talking before we started recording, I actually saw one of your PESI presentations a few years ago and was really very impressed with the work that you do. Um, And I just wanted to give you an opportunity to share with the listeners a little bit about yourself and the work that you do. Thank you. Um, So I am an occupational therapist and I have been one for over 20 years years now. And it's really been my passion. Um, I was one of those people that wasn't exactly sure what they wanted to do after entering into college and occupational therapy found me. Um, So I've been in the area of self-regulation, neuroscience, neuroanatomy, making those connections to behavior and function. Um, And, you know, really focusing on that in terms of my own practice which led me to then have for my private practice go into academia and continuing my own education and receiving my doctorate of OT and then my PhD in health sciences, uh, and then being able to really bring in the next few generations of occupational therapy practitioners. Um, And so I've been an author, you know, I've, I've done a lot of speaking engagements and now I am working at the American Occupational Therapy Association Um, And I'm the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, Justice, Access, and Belonging. It's a huge title Um, with a lot of weight on my shoulders in regards to that. Um, But I'm enjoying and I'm enjoying being able to really just connect not only with our community, uh, but with the community at large and showing that occupational therapy and what we do can really, uh, as one of my colleagues likes to say, be the secret sauce. You know, we can help you with that occupation of living um, and, and supporting individuals of all age ranges. So a lot of my work has been geared towards children. However, we we know, um, you know, that the neural system is what it is and it develops and it changes. But the strategies that I present can also be really geared to adults in the lifespan. And so my latest work, Trauma Treatment in Action, does focus on the lifespan, Um, even though my career has been really directed a lot to the pediatric realm. That is incredible. I mean, it is, it's one of those things, um, occupational therapy, they, people might not know what that means, people might not understand that, but as a person who's worked in schools before, Um, I always found it to be super helpful to coordinate with the other people in roles like occupational therapy in schools, working together to support the children, because we we're all looking at the same child, right? But we look at the child and the things that they're dealing with in a very different way. And it's always so Mm -hmm. interesting to work together and figure out and talk together and figure out what's going to work for this kid. This is what what I bring to the table. This is what I bring to the table. Um, one of my favorite memories is working um, in a group. We, I was running a group with a, one of my best friends who happens to be an occupational therapist. And we would do, have the same idea and what she was doing it for and what I was doing it for were like two different things, but it was the same activity. <laughs> right. 
Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Those are, I think those are the best, you know, sessions. Um, the energy is usually pretty good too. Um, and I'm a believer in that. Um, so, you know, the child is um, getting exposed even to that oxytocin that is um, being pumped around. And um, yeah, you're right. I, I can recall being in sessions with the speech language pathologist, myself, behavioral therapist, and we might be playing, you know, tossing the ball back and forth and naming a, a color or something when the child catches it. I'm looking at motor skills and, you know, visual motor uh, attention, social interaction, and they may be looking at, you know, that social interaction piece as well, but also how the child is regulating and following directions. And then the SLP is looking at articulation perhaps and language. So you're right, the same activity, but for different purposes. It's, it's so much fun. And I cannot emphasize enough the power of having a multidisciplinary team. And that's, that mm -hmm. was the power of working in a school where you had all those resources where you could come together and really tackle some really big issues that were going on and have fun being able to have fun and do it together and have people who are professionals who you can, you rely on each other you trust each other's expertise. It's beautiful when that can happen. It's wonderful. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I talk about mirror neurons. Um, I'm really intrigued by, by that um, and that we are wired, you know, uh, to perceive. And I forget who said it, Dan Siegel, I believe. We're wired to perceive the mind of another being. And so if you're trying to help a child with their self-regulation and with their um, social interaction attention, the best way to do that is modeling that and, you know, and to be really engaged in that. And then they are going to, for lack of a better word, vibe off of that. And then really there's a neurological response that occurs within them. Oh my goodness. That is such powerful information for people to understand. And I, I often talk about that when I talk about teaching coping skills, like we need to actually model that in order for kids to be able to do that. Right. And so that just, that's just life. That's how we are wired to learn and be and you know, interact with one another. I love that. So I'm loving that you're dipping into this neuroscience for my audience. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about neuroscience and self-regulation. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, Years ago, someone asked me to do a talk on self-regulation and a colleague of mine, you know, I was saying, well, what exactly do they want? You know, um, I'm not exactly sure what they want to talk about, you know, specifically for X amount of hours. Um, give me more information. She was saying, well, you know, it's, it's pretty much sensory, right? It's just sensory integration. And I said, no, I feel like it's more than that, you know, um, let me really delve into this idea a little bit more because it's one thing to say, you know, someone's self-regulation or you can self-regulate, but when someone asks you to do a six hour presentation on it, I'm going to need a little bit more to back this up. Um, so, you know, and I'm a believer in evidence-based practice. And so looking at the science and um, the research, it really spoke to me that self-regulation is very dynamic. And I whittle it down to three areas, but even those three are dynamic in themselves, which is sensory processing, right? And how we take in everything from our environment, kind of digest it and, and then use it. And then our cognition, our, our thought processes, our problem solving skills, our executive functioning is another. And then the emotional regulation piece has to go along with that, right? So as sensory information comes in, we then, you know, first we have a feeling, right? And then we have an emotion, that emotion steps in. And then last we have that that thought and hopefully a response. And the challenges comes and really when, you know, that emotional brain tends to take over, that sensory system takes over, leading the emotional brain to take over. And then you react more than you are able to respond because it's fight, flight, survival at that, that moment for most. And that neurological connection about how those pathways occur, how do we bring in information to the body? What happens in our emotions? Where do they lie? What's being triggered to lead to such a response? It's really that neural anatomy, that neuroscience piece, 
You have to have a basic understanding of what that is to understand why someone like myself might recommend um, a child get deep pressure to their body or that they swing and, you know, you do some, you know, do that to get them to do a functional task to follow. Why would I do this to then get them to be able to go and tie their shoes or to dress themselves? Um, and so that that neural anatomy kind of gives people that aha moment of, oh, well, that makes sense. You know, if you have this part of your brain that I like to call a little chihuahua that is hyperactive and is always on watch and making sure that no one walks up to the door, such as the mailman, right? I'm thinking about my dog as I speak. Um, and that little chihuahua is constantly, you know, hyperactive, that it is being triggered when there's too much sound or there's too, you know, too much sensory information coming in at one time. And the way that you would then calm that might be with some pressure, like such as petting it, right? And we call that little area of our of our nervous system, our limbic system, our emotional brain, that then that area of our brain could be calmed and organized through things that happen in our body because it has a direct connection, right? And so learning that allows us to better understand intervention and then selecting the most appropriate tools at least to try and, and understanding that everyone is different. I think that is, it makes so much sense to be aware that different kids are going to respond differently to some of the suggestions, right? So there are going to be kids who need to be doing more swinging, maybe kids need to be doing heavy work, and you want to know what is going to be most helpful for them. And I always say, whenever I give my, like my six hour talks, I'm like, I'm not that expert. You need to talk to an occupational therapist. I am not that girl. Um, <laughs> because, <laughs> right. because I, I can, I can give ideas and give suggestions, but I don't know the child that you're working with in, in front of you. Right. And so I don't want to say something and then have you try it and just and then people are like, oh, it didn't work. Well, it depends on the kid, right? Like you have to know what mm -hmm. their sensory profile looks like and what's going to escalate them or keep them in a calmer spot or get them a little bit down regulated, right? Like you need to know the child yeah. and you exactly. and the, the person who knows a kid in terms of their occupational therapy life is the occupational therapist. <laughs> yes, exactly. And you know, we... I think those who are OTs and OTAs are very much about the team, which is sometimes, you know, people would say maybe to our detriment a little bit that we need to be more outspoken, more proactive and promoting OT, but we're so like, come on, you know, <laughs> let's work together. Um, but it, that is the best thing, as you said earlier, for us to do. And believe me, there are scopes of practices, um, areas of scopes of practices, I should say, that are outside of us, you know, I personally love going to therapy for my own mental health and to stay mentally healthy. Um, and I know the techniques that that therapists would utilize is not so much without of my outside of my scope. It's outside of my personal expertise, right? What she brings is just different. And so I, you know, someone like myself could assist, right? It could make that session even more, um, you know, have better outcomes if I made recommendations, but I shouldn't be the sole person involved in that care um, because that person needs someone that is trained in that area. So we we have to be interprofessional. Now my soapbox moment is that sometimes occupational therapy is left out and we're trying to do things such as talk therapy, um, trying to do you know some solely behavioral techniques. Whereas if we were to include those who understand that mind, body, spirit, connection, personal, you know, holistic approach that we could make better gains if we were included. Absolutely. And it's, it really becomes thinking about the whole entire child. We're not thinking about just a behavior. We're not thinking about just school or how they're performing in math or reading. We're, we're thinking about we need to think holistically. I think that's the best thing that we can do to help support kids, especially as they're if they're struggling and we're not sure what to do. We need as many eyes as possible to be doing the good work of looking and seeing, well, what if we tried this? What if we tried that? And thinking with all of our different professional points of view and thinking about what would be the most helpful. Absolutely. So 
I love that you um, have really focused on um, pediatrics and really focusing on children. And I'd love to hear, you know, your go-to self-regulation strategies for kids. Like I know that we just talked about, we need to be individualizing for the kids that that are in front of us, but are there things that you really like to try with kids at the beginning when you're doing work with them or things that you found to be super helpful that you really would recommend for people to try? Mm -hmm. Well, there are a few, um, and I will say that the techniques that I share tend to be interprofessional because you might be using them to prepare for your session, and it could what follows could be completely different than what I would do, right? Um, so I have to give that disclaimer because occupational therapy, we're about occupation. Um, so I wouldn't, I don't want to say certain things and, and then lead to me not being, coming from an occupational lens. However, um, I like to call these, uh, some of the things that my go-tos would be, would be activities that support occupation or activities that might support your session. You know, um, I, I've heard from various therapists, whether they are psychologists or SLPs uh, that do require the child to sit and attend teachers or paint and they're like, well, how am I going to even get to my goals if I can't get the child to sit still? So now what do I do? <laughs> right. So. So we kind of all start at that same place where, you know, we're trying to help that child to self-regulate then to go into our own individual professional goals for that for that child. And so I, I do like to start with um, I like music and rhythm. I'm a farmer, professional dancer. I like to say I'm still a dancer, but I dance professionally throughout a bulk of my life. And so I realized how rhythm and sound and movement is very regulatory. Um, you know, I could go have a, a rough day, a bad day, be extremely tired and cranky and get to a dance rehearsal and come out just feeling amazing, right? You get that endorphin release. Um, and so a lot of the children, you know, whether they are, you know, hyperactive or they have some hypo, right, where they're not hyperactive at all, they may be kind of floppy and, um, you know, lethargic. Either way, us engaging with them um, and waking up that body is helping them to become more organized. In the clinic, you know, we try to avoid saying calm down because what does that mean exactly? And what does that mean to that child? We want them to be alert and organized, especially to be able to engage. And so I, I like to decrease um, stimulation that might cause hyperactivity or that might cause, um, you know, fight flight reactions too much or artificial light is not great. Um, so as, as many times as I could, I would turn down the lighting. Um, I like to do, use rhythmic music because the brain likes that. We have brain waves or neural oscillations that when they are in sync, our body really responds well to that. And you, you get that dopamine, the good juices flowing. So drumming type of music. Um, if I'm doing something as simple as using a swing, I might be swinging with the rhythm of the drum. Um, I could even have a child on a ball that if I'm trying to get their muscles activated, I'm bouncing them to the rhythm of the drum and I'm counting. Um, and so really those type of, I try to target more than one sensory area at a time. Um, so, I, and I will say I'm not currently, you know, treating, I do a lot of consultation, um, may do some pro bono someone's asking a question, um, I, I give advice, <laughs> so, or have the parent do it, uh, depending, but, you know, in those, in my, in my past, I had a clinic where I had all the equipment and things that I could utilize, and that definitely my go-to would be music, um, decreasing additional stimulation, uh, and movement, rhythm and movement. Oh my goodness, you are, saying exactly what I've heard from several other people in terms of the connection of rhythm and movement and regulation. So I had um, Lynn Kenny on to talk about executive function and she talks about a lot of rhythm. Um, Sophie T Garner, who is actually a singer and songwriter talks about the beauty of music as does Ryan Judd. And I've had the three of them on the podcast and I'll link to those in the show notes. But it is, again, just reaffirming that power of music, movement, rhythm, and how it really is something in our bodies that we respond to that. It's not just, it sounds nice. Like there's 
there's a reaction that's happening that is helping us regulate ourselves. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, it, it definitely is. I mean, and I think a lot of us utilize it without even realizing every day, you know, um, there are a lot of music lovers, but you don't have to be a music lover to, to, to acknowledge that, you know, what rhythm does for you. If, if you need calming, how many people rock or, you know, ride their hands or, you know, or how many people go to chew gum? That's a rhythm. All right. And, and it helps you to organize when you're feeling a little stressed. And, I never you know, even so thought about that. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. Chewing, um, you know, even sucking something through a straw, all those things um, are leading to some some rhythmic type of activity that is then going to really target not just your brain, but your your brain stem area, the area that is really letting in sensory information and, and filtering that sensory information and Yeah, we, we all, we use it a lot. And even if we're not thinking about it. That's really neat to, to have that realization that chewing gum is actually like rhythmic. I had never thought about that. It's really, mm -hmm. it's neat. And I'm wondering, you know, one thing that I've been, um, I think you may, I may have heard this from you actually about the um, using cool to calm down. So using a cool temperature on the back of the neck. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so, so briefly, we have different parts of the nervous system that are reflexive, right? That um, will respond based upon evolution or however you want to look at it um, as a survival tactic, right? And so cold temperature is one that typically will bring down your heart rate um, and uh, allow you to be more organized. Even though, you know, initially, like if someone were to walk up and put an ice cube on your back, you're going to go into fight flight, right? It's going to be a shocker. Um, but if you were to engage, you know, with cold temperature kind of knowingly and, you know, for a little bit of a time, you don't want to be ex extended period of time. But if you were to engage with it, even think about those who would recommend a cold shower as an example, like at the end of your, your shower, you know, just a few seconds of the cold water will help you to regulate, you'll get dopamine release. It helps to kind of balance and organize. They actually say it's better than having a cup of coffee. Um, and so it allows you, I mean, unless you like the taste like I do, uh, so <laughs> still have to have my cup, um, but really gets you to that, that self-regulatory state that you might be seeking. Um, so it's a neurological reflexive um, act that you respond to cold temperatures. So in the therapy world, and mostly mental health, actually, um, they call it ice therapy. I think that's really neat to think about. And it's one of those things that I've seen how it works really well when you have, you know, a kid is angry and they come in, they have like cold water. They put a cold, uh, net, um, cold cloth on the back of their neck or, you know, mm -hmm. Even when you're having a panic attack, holding an ice cube, um, those yeah. the the power of just using a temperature to help you regulate yourself is it's a kind of neat thing to think about the how it, your body actually responds to that. Yeah, yeah, and how we're wired to respond to it. You know, the there's a major nerve that's connected that then re reacts. That's really responsible for that. Uh, rest and digestion part of your nervous system that says, oh, okay, I'm on, you know, <laughs> it's like a light switch for it almost like, okay, it's my turn. To, okay. Let's just balance everything. Let's just chill everything out and good. Okay. Now we're, now we're fine. That's responding to that, that cold temperature is really amazing when you think about it. That is really neat. Is that, which nerve is that? The vagus nerve. Vagus nerve. Yeah. So if people want to learn more about vagus nerve and they I, I you know I've see, I'm starting to see this stuff about like vagus exercises that you can do um and I I've wanted to like dig into that a little bit further with people who um whose reputations and knowledge I trust <laughs> so it's it gets a little <laughs> bit tricky right because people anybody yeah can on Instagram right anybody it makes me nervous hearing that I'm like oh I don't know <laughs> Right. So it is one of those, it's because everybody like I, the, the rabbit hole that I fall down on Instagram reels, right. It, they, because of who I am and what I look at, it does pop up for me. And I'm like, but I don't know who you yeah. are. 
where's your doctorate? Right. Like, like, <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. It's, it is a little scary. And then sometimes you hear almost something that flagged you. Like, I know, I, I know that they heard this from me somehow, but they misconstrued it. <laughs> Not what I meant. Right. And so and that's where I'm Honestly. always like, I want to go to sources where that I know and can trust, like people who have experience, people who have been doing work for a while, people who have degrees, people who know what they're talking about and have done this work with kids. And so it's I I ended up talking to somebody else about this as well. Oh, Montessori. I was talking with a person I was interviewing about Montessori and talking about okay. this stuff. <laughs> but it comes. It's the same thing. It's the same thing yeah. that comes up, right? Like you see and it looks really pretty and it looks really great but like how how you have to do like your own research and really like finding evidence-based practice not just like what looks cute on instagram right <laughs> right exactly exactly and and understand you know trying something that you don't understand could actually go the opposite way it could make things worse and especially if you are a clinician and you're um, trying out something on a child without having that background knowledge. And uh, it, it could lead the child to not wanting to come to your sessions, you know, and right. be a real challenge. So you really need to understand how to implement certain um, techniques and why you would implement them. There are certain things that I wouldn't do. I wasn't formally trained in it. I'm not going to do it. Well, right. And same for me. Like I have a license and I have a master's degree in counseling, but there are certain techniques I don't have the experience or knowledge or expertise in. So I'm not going mm -hmm. to do that. Like, I just don't, that's not where I've focused. And, you know, there's lots of different ways that you can work with and support children and teens in their work. But I, I'm very clear about, I don't know how to do that. That sounds great. I will look into that. I've got plenty of time left in my clinical world and life. And I like, I'm exploring new things. I'm always open to trying new stuff, but I'm not going to absolutely like try something without having the background knowledge of it first, right? Like to be able to say, I found this. And this, and then I backed it up by looking at these other things that other people who have had a lot of experience have done as well. So, and have found it to be helpful and to acknowledge, mm -hmm. like, you know, I have, I am an expert in this area, but I am not an expert in this area and be clear about right. that. I think that's one of those things we need to be super duper clear about when we're working with people. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, you know, even though in my day job, we may have members that, want to seek out information um, or can we provide a resource on that? If it's a topic that we think is worthy, you know, that the masses could utilize. If it's not my area, I'm, I'm looking for an expert that can do it, right. That can contribute that knowledge that I can't. So I would always, you know, when I, when I was a professor, I would have colleagues that, you know, maybe new or maybe to a new, um, content area. And I would always say, if you don't know it, just admit it. Stu students can sniff that out a mile away. And yeah. so can children, right? If oh, you are yeah. not confident in doing something, they know, <laughs> but you cannot fake it. So just be honest and stay away from it or say, I don't know, um, right. you know, and, and find someone that does. And, and there's power in being able to, there's, there's power in saying, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know if this is something that will work for you. And to be okay with that, to be comfortable right. with not being, yeah. to know, I, I don't know everything. And I learn and I change and I grow. What I talked about 10 years ago is different than what I talked about today. What I talked about when I first started out is different than what I talked about today. So, you know, I'm always learning, mm -hmm. always growing, always room for improvement. And I'm, you know, just try to do the best that I can with the knowledge I have at this moment in time. And I'll just keep growing. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've learned a lot from the children I work with that were autistic. Uh, they, they're, I don't even know what to call it. Like they're, they're chihuahua on their brain, right? <laughs> their little alert system is the best detective of someone that is not confident or, you know, just not comfortable with something. They, I have seen children that aren't truly aggressive become aggressive in the presence of, you know, a clinician that is hesitant um, and that almost has their own fear. It goes back to the mirror neurons I told you about, right? So you're, they're in fear 
Now you're triggering a child to be in fear and a child's reaction is to protect themselves. Whereas they may become aggressive or they may elope and run away. And we're not even realizing that. No, it's not, it's not them per se, it's you, you know? So, you know, you, you have to be really, you know, find the things that work well for you. Like you asked me a question in the beginning, or what are my go-tos? So what are your go-tos of things that work well for you that you can then tailor and craft, you know, to be unique for that child, at least to start, because the first step is building a rapport. I used to always joke that that was when I got a caseload, that the first set of notes was, they were the easiest for me to do. Cause I would always write building a rapport. You know, still building a rapport, the easiest notes, because that's what I focused on in the beginning, which is relationship building and getting that chemistry going. Well, and the connection is key, right? So I, those are my favorite notes to write too. building rapport. I do the same thing, like, at the because that's what you have to do. Like, nobody's going to talk to you about their feelings if they don't feel comfortable. Like, that's really hard. It's hard to talk about your toughest moments when you don't feel a connection with somebody. You don't feel like you have a relationship yet. So you have to build a relationship. It's absolutely the right. base of really any human connection. You have to build that, you have to build that relationship in order to do the work that you want to do. Right. So yes, um, yes, exactly. Absolutely. Oh I love this. I could continue to talk to you forever, but I want to be respectful of your time. So um I just want to ask one more question. Um, and I ask this of all my guests, what are your go-to coping skills? What do you do to rest and relax? Ah, thank you for that. I, I like that. Um, I realize that I, I, a lot of the techniques that I suggest to people, I do myself. Um, I, I definitely, you know, still love music and dance. So listening to certain music that does it for me, um, it can change my mood just like that. And so that's definitely one decreasing the stimuli around me. Um, you know, sometimes I could be sitting in a room and one of my family mem members will walk in. Oh my God, I didn't know you were there. <laughs> you, know? you know, I'm sitting, I might have the door open with a breeze without the TV, without, you know, any lighting except for what's coming in from the earth, <laughs> what the creator gave us. That Those are my go-tos. Um, and I do love to meditate. I'm very spiritual. So I do have, uh, I try to have a decent spiritual hygiene, which has been challenged recently with life and schedule. Um, but I try to make a, you know, dedicated time, at least in the AM and PM to just be still. Um, even, you know, even if you have thoughts, I always tell people, you know, meditation sounds so challenging and, um, that you have to just have zero thoughts in your mind. And that's not exactly true. It's just being still and allowing that energy to flow. So those are my, my personal practices to, to cope and to regulate. Oh, that's beautiful. And I always tell people too, like a reg a meditation, you don't have to have an empty mind. I never have an empty mind. Like it's just, yeah. <laughs> I, my mind won't I haven't do quite mastered it yet. <laughs> right. <laughs> But you, you know, there's lots of different ways that you can meditate and be mindful and you don't have, it does, you don't have to like have this one way of thinking about it. There's lots of ways that you can do it. So I'm, I'm loving hearing how other people um, use that strategy to be able to help themselves in your, their day-to-day -day lives. I think it's wonderful. Um, if people want to learn more about you or hear about your, read about your work, read your books, where should they go? Um, so a few things. So I obviously have a, my hand in a couple of areas, but in terms of, you know, um, the work that we, we've been referencing, uh, at Amazon, if you look up for Alicia, I think I'm still the only one around. I'm not sure. There might be some babies floating around. Um, <laughs> my, my former name, Barlisha Gibbs is my author name. Um, and so you can find it on Amazon. Um, I also have Lawsuit Sanctuary, which is W-A-S-U-T sanctuary.com uh, where you can find out more about me directly and then um, my role that I, I really am enjoying and loving um, at AOTA I'm on their web page as one of their vice presidents and especially if it's something pertaining to the world of occupational therapy um, you can certainly find me there wonderful thank you so much for coming on the podcast I really appreciate it and to the listeners thank you so much for tuning in um, if you enjoy this podcast, please take a moment and share it with your friends and colleagues. And as always, take a few minutes, have a little fun, and have an awesome day.